Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. Welcome everybody to our first virtual event of 2020. You can see the wonderful Emma in HD. Hi to me. <laughs> I think you did a brilliant introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Um, cool. So, Emma, as I said, uh, we all got to um, watch your video um, and we met you for the first time on the TEDx Youth at Cape Town stage um, in 2018, where you spoke to us about the work that you were doing. Um, for those of us who maybe weren't there or haven't watched the, the video yet, um, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are? Thanks, Kimmy. So uh, my name is Emer Butler and I'm from Johannesburg originally, but studying at Stellenbosch University. I completed my undergrad in computer science and it was during that time that I started the Ntomi project with a friend and that was the topic of my previous TEDx talk and the idea about that was on this notion of automating equality so how we could leverage technology to create systems of fair access. I'm now completing my honours degree at Stellenbosch University in linguistics so it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a field turn that is not too distant. Um, I'm also an Alan Gray Orbis candidate fellow which is a mouthful really just to say that I've been identified as a high impact uh, leader and the foundation has given me a really cool opportunity to develop my entrepreneurial thinking skills over the last four years. I'm super enthusiastic about problem solving as well as social impact and the last four years being involved with the foundation and with my degree I've spent some time really reflecting on how entrepreneurship plays a role in social impact especially in South Africa. Wow, that's that's quite a lot that you're involved with, um, and and we'll unpack um, a little bit more of that in our conversation um, as we go. But one of the things that um, strikes me um, is this like varied interest that or the varied interests that you've got between linguistics and computer science and. Initially, when I found that out about you, it made no sense to me. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I wonder, maybe there might be some others on the call who are going, what on earth? <laughs> um, so wh why, don't you, why don't you help us understand that a little bit? Um, how do you blend those two very different disciplines in, in your mind? So this is actually quite a common question. Um, can you sort of feel befuddled on your own? And I, you know, my best response has actually been a follow-up question of, have you ever said, okay, Google, or used Siri on your phone? Yes, more than I would like to admit. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, at least you were conscious of doing so. Sometimes people are suspicious about these functions being activated without uh, ordering them to be. But that's you using language to interface with the device, right? And if you think about computer science, you can think of it as a language to control devices or make devices do what we want them to do. And so the part of linguistics and computer science coming together is in this really cute field called computational linguistics. So there is actually a very natural overlap that is not really obvious to people right away. But when you think about it, language this is also not obvious, but, but, but when you actually look at it, language is incredibly structured and it's very nuanced and it's, there's so much freedom in what you can do with it. It's really beautiful in that sense, but it's also very structured. Every language has a grammar, right, which, which is what makes it distinct as a human language. So the idea that we have nouns and verbs and subjects and objects and sentences, all of, of these are, are structural characteristics of language. And you can think of computer science as being a field that thrives in handling structural complexity. So language has structure and it's really complex, but computer science is really great at using things that are structurally complex and making sense from them. So that's sort of where it overlaps. Uh, speech recognition, writing chatbots is another very natural space for computational linguistics. Yeah. Thank you. That, that <laughs> makes it um, all the more compelling um, that, uh, 
us humanities uh, leaning folk <laughs> are actually needed in the world <laughs> in the world of uh, computer science and engineering. <laughs> and uh, if if you'd asked me, you know, what the overlap was, certainly before I met you. Um, or before sort of, you know, any foray of mine into tech, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it. But I think that um, explanation helps us all um, get a better understanding of how natural actually the overlap really is. So thank you. I mean, another, another really, like, another really cool part of it that I'm very passionate about personally is translation tools. So when you use Google Translate, what do you think is going on? You know, you're using code to translate languages, basically. That's what's going on. And, and that's a, another thriving part of computational linguistics. Oh, wow. I hadn't actually thought of that at all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, I mean, you, you've got a lot of thoughts and you seem to think about the world in quite an interesting, dynamic and intersectional way, um, which is fantastic. Um, but at what point did you go from, okay, well, I've got these ideas and I've got these thoughts. I think I might be ready for the TEDx stage. Um, what gave you the final push that said, all right, I'm ready to give a TEDx talk? I had this idea with Ntombi, right? And let, 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 let's, get, let's get to the roots of what TED is about and TED Talks and TEDx Talks. It's about ideas worth sharing, right? And one thing that you learn when going through the TED process or the TEDx Talk preparation that really taught me was that you don't really know what you're talking about if you can't distill it into three sentences, right? And I think it's such a poetic way to really force you to distill the, the idea that you have, the way that you see the world, um, because things can be so incredibly complicated when you have so many varying interests. But when you, when you try and pursue something, but you sit and you try and you put it into a single idea, um, that, that's kind of what the TEDx way of, of, of um, encapsulating ideas showed me to do. It showed me how to sit down and take this big idea and put it into one thing. And when I was thinking about what I was trying to achieve with Mpombi, like how would I put that into an idea? So when I came to applying for speaking on TEDx, I was like, okay, cool. Um, what am I trying to do here really? And the more I thought about it, the simpler it became. And I realized that really, I just believe that technology is a tool to create systems of social equality. We don't talk about that enough. And when I came down to realizing on paper, oh, that's actually what I'm trying to do with this dispenser that I was building, um, trying to create fair access to an item of basic need. I was like, that is something that I can take to the TEDx stage because that is something that is so important for the world to start talking about. We don't have enough conversations around how technology is a catalyst for social equality. We're not talking about how we can use technology to build those systems. And I remember in my talk, it's not a new idea at all, right? And I can't take, I can't take credit for it like it is. But in my talk, I asked that question of what if inequality is not a consequence of scarcity, but a consequence of failing distribution systems? That's not a new idea, but not enough people are talking about it or evaluating how we might rectify those failing systems. And I think what's what's so phenomenal about this space and time that we're living in right now with this global pandemic is we're being really pushed to question and dismantle failing systems and rightfully so horrible things are being exposed as they should be and as they've always been there but now they're just being really exposed in this time and it's also a time where we're being pushed towards technology forcefully like there, there's no choice really we have to have this zoom meeting there isn't the space to have in-person contact right now right and it, it brings us back to that question of how are we using technology to build systems of social equality so we're in a time of of um humanity where the necessity to use tech is developing tech right and there are so many systems that are being called into question that are being dismantled and it's the opportunity to rebuild those systems and we have to do so using technology and it comes back to this idea of using tech for social justice right or just just building systems of equal access 
and that was that was the idea that I spoke about so much in my TEDx talk and I, I really feel like it's important for us as South Africans in this country to be cognizant of how we're doing that how we are using technology and if we're using it mindfully because there's such a large gap right at the, the tech divide is a very real inequality that we don't really discuss but that's being brought into light with this COVID situation you know not being able to access um, university education or ha not having a laptop at home you know various examples are coming up about inequality that the tech divide has also created and this time in our humanity and our history is one for rebuilding those systems and and i believe in a true elon musk fashion we need to derive these new systems from first principles and one of the questions in our first principles should be are we using tech to build a system that strengthens social equality or weakens it are we creating fair access or are we defeating fair, fair access are we, are we keeping that back from people um, yeah. So yeah, that, that idea was what brought me to the next stage and, and it's still keeping me going today. <laughs> well, I was going to say that, um, you know, it, it brought you to the TEDx stage in 2018. And as we'll discuss with um, what you're working on at the moment, I think once you go back to those first principles, as you mentioned, might be a question that fuels certainly your life, Emma. <laughs> but, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, you know, these are big questions um, being asked um, by everybody to an extent, um, uh, certainly by, by um, a lot of people right now who are evaluating, as you say, the systems that are being um, highlighted as fundamentally broken and those who are working really hard to reimagine what that world might look like um, as we start to rebuild whatever it is that we rebuild um, after, after. I don't even know what to say, like after COVID, after level three, after, you know, well, um, I, I what like, is left. I like, um, but I must admit, maybe it's the linguist in me. I like the little alliteration in the new normal, which seems to be a buzzword that's going around, you know, at the moment. I, I like how people are not really buzzing the fourth industrial revolution so much, but they're totally buzzing the new normal, which, you know, is, <laughs> to me, it's, it's just a really cute way of, of describing that space that we have no idea when it will be or how it will be, but it will just have to be and it will have to be the normal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've touched on or we've alluded to kind of, um, uh, Ntombi, uh, which is the um, enterprise you were working on when we met you on the TEDx, Cape Town, TEDx Youth at Cape Town stage a few years ago, and now what you're working on. Um, let's talk a little bit then about um, Ntombi.org. Um, can you tell us maybe just very briefly what it was, what it is, um, and what has happened with the organization since you spoke about it in 2018? So what it was is what it still is. <laughs> it still exists. <laughs> um, uh, so it's a project for creating fair access to items of basic need. And those items are specifically menstrual health management items. So pads, tampons, sanitary towels for women in public spaces. And it started with encountering the personal problem of not having a pad or a tampon when I needed it on campus and then being like, gosh, I don't have one and I have to walk home, you know, past these free condoms. Like there's this continuous thing, I love it. Sorry, maybe it's just being a menstrual health activist, but there's this, this, this uh, little statement going around on Instagram I've seen a few times. So it's like, it doesn't make sense, right? Because sex is a choice, so condoms are free. But menstrual health is not, like periods are not a choice, yet we pay for pads. It doesn't make sense, right? And so the, the essence of the Ntombi project was to address that fundamental flaw in reasoning and to create fair access to pads on campus and spaces, um, public spaces. And the vision behind that was to have a dispenser that had some sort of, um, like a, let's say, 
on campus specifically some sort of controlled method for accessing a pad so that would be like your student card or it could be a pin or it could be a biometric fingerprint reader you know there are many variations to the device and we chose to focus on using an rfid tag so a student card and we wanted to put it up on campus so 2018 uh, the middle of 2018 the the idea was born and we spoke about it on the stage in november in 2019 we happened to develop the software behind that idea which i think is quite a big feat and uh, it's really interesting you know when you're like a full-time student and your co-founders are full-time working people and you're just like the energy is there but what you learn as a as a co-founder what you learn as a leader is like you you can motivate people, but you can't make time happen. You can't make more time. It just, you can't do that, right? And so given our full-time occupations, we still happened to get some funding together, get the software developed. And we decided to be really patient about it. And I think compassionate leadership was such a big learning for me, like feeling really frustrated like, why aren't my co-founders doing this? And I feel like I'm doing everything. But then also sitting down and saying, wait, wait, hold on, they are people they have jobs i am a person too and i have a job which is my studies and i can't be sitting here feeling like people aren't doing enough when i'm completely ignoring the fact that they're humans and they only have so much energy and time right so we developed the software we learned about compassionate leadership which is really important and the goal for 2020 was to take the software that we have which is industry ready and to develop a prototype that would be industry ready as well so building a physical box that we could put up on campus and start stress testing start actually putting this idea into fruition with with proper market testing right and uh yeah no you can't do that in lockdown can you <laughs> so the idea is sort of the project is on ice right now um, but as an alternative, we, while, while Ntombi paused, I decided to um, use the capital that I had there and I started a different project with that that could take place during this time in lockdown. That's fantastic. Um, and, and we'll jump into that project um, in a little bit. I, I really... Um, resonate with what you mentioned about you can't generate time um, <laughs> as somebody I, I, who is potentially too optimistic about very many things yes. um, you know wanting to jump all in and do all the things at all the hours you realize mm. very quickly um, that you can't generate time but but there's also something so um real and wonderful about um compassionate leadership that that you touched on as well um that you know while you can take the point of view that well everybody isn't working as hard as me like look at me burning the candle on both ends right. why are you not picking up your socks to say well actually maybe we're coming at this from different points of view um, and maybe everybody's lived reality looks different um yeah. Yeah. So, and then of course, as, as did we as a, as a volunteer community with TEDx Cape Town have to realize that something very real has happened here with, with yeah. COVID and we have to take a moment to rethink what we're focusing on. Um, and, and we'll, we'll chat to that in, in a little bit. Um, so, Okay, so you take this time, you say, all right, maybe it's time for a new venture. Um, and even in that new venture, I mean, you spoke about first principles and how we need to be thinking about these systems and fundamentally like enabling access. Um, it seems like you are wired to solve social problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so what is so exciting about that, that even in the new venture, um, you've decided that you're going to look at social impact as your focus? So I think, I think there's something fundamentally exciting about solving problems <laughs> like that in itself is just exciting. And, and anybody who has ever had to, you know, who, anyone who has experienced the elation of mathematics will have to say, here, here, 
And I know not everyone has had that experience with maths, but it is, it is just the slight addiction of having to struggle, even if that's really just like mentally sometimes with a problem and then squeezing out the solution in your brain and then it happens, right? So I think, I think you know, wired to solve problems is, is really the part that makes me so excited. It's just that problem solving thing. Uh, this reminds me of um, my younger sister who is now in grade eight and learning online and she's struggling with some maths and we were having a conversation about it. And I said to her, I asked her why she's struggling. She said, no, you know, she doesn't understand the work. And I said to her, but you know, maths can be so fun. And she's like, yeah, I know, if you know what you're doing. And I was like, well, that's the point, right? It, it, problem solving is about practicing something recurrently until you start to get it right. And then it becomes really addictive. You know, anyone who's ever written a, like code will know this as well. It's like this 99% frustration state and then the one percent when your code compiles and runs and you're just like i am i am you know almighty <laughs> um but i i found like so so the, the part that always you know is driving me to solve problems is, is really just that addiction to to solving the problems and i found that a lot of the social ventures or social impact that my my ventures tend to have is always a consequence of solving a problem that i'm facing myself so it's never i used to think actually when i spoke about entrepreneurship i used to think i used to say quite wrongfully that it it's a selfish approach but wrong it's wrong to use the word selfish because selfish means that you have a disregard for others and I, i've now learned that it's more self-centered like i would sit and think with with Ntomi, for example what problem am i having oh i can't access parents when i need them most and consequentially every other woman has had this experience just by virtue of the fact that they have a uterus you know so there was the social impact in that but it had started with wanting to solve a problem for myself and I think that's a really powerful catalyst in, um, in social entrepreneurship is when you look at a problem that you are having and you know it affects other people. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something I'll speak to a bit later as we go into the new venture, but often when we assume other people have a problem and we try to solve that and we, we repackage that as social entrepreneurship, we run into the realization that we kind of maybe assumed the problem that they were having. So yeah, this, this addiction to solving problems has, has a, a nice consequence um, of social impact in, in the stuff that I do. And I do it because I think what might other people be experiencing, but what problem am I experiencing? And I try and solve that first. So that's interesting about like solving the problem that you're experiencing, because some of the stories that you've shared with me before um, with your new venture, Afika, um, actually were not problems that you were facing, but problems that you were noticing. And that seems like a subtle, but actually fundamental change. So can you tell us a little bit about Afika and how that change um, made you rethink the way that you were approaching that problem specifically? Right. So I think, I think you've articulated really well um in saying that it's more a problem than i had noticed but I, I i want to stress how there's a there's a comes a point where you have to choose to take responsibility of your citizenship in the situation and that needs to drive you to take action so the particular problem that i had was i you know i noticed um hello corona arrived and I was busy driving somewhere before lockdown even. And I noticed that there were a whole bunch of people in a taxi squashed and they were driving past. And I just thought, this is so fundamentally wrong. These people are in a confined space sharing the same air. We know how easily contagious this virus is. We know that it is just fundamentally wrong how people who had the privilege of traveling have brought this problem to this country and people who are not in as privileged positions are going to suffer as a consequence of that. That upset me. That to me was a problem. I had the problem that people were not wearing face masks and they needed to be wearing face masks. And I identified that as a problem that I noticed, but it bothered me so much because it wasn't being solved. Right. So the onus, at least for me, felt like it was myself. 
um, how am I going to solve that problem? As opposed to this thing of, like Michael Jackson likes to say, you know, start looking at the man in the mirror type of vibe. I mean, you see this thing going on and you think this is a problem I'm noticing, but oh well, I'll just describe how it's a problem and I won't take action to change it. So yeah, it is in a sense noticing a problem, but you, if by making it your own problem, at least for me, by making it my own problem, it drove me to want to take action and to change, and to solve it, you know. And so how is Afika solving it? What, what is Afika? Um, and, and what do you do? So do you create face masks? Is that what you're saying? Right. So <clears throat> when I noticed this, this situation um, of the taxi driving past, there was this idea of making face masks, masks that I kept coming up. And I love, I really do love this quote, this idea that I shared in my first, you know, in my TEDx talk from Elizabeth Gilbert in that ideas are alive and that they're like, just fly over and they sit on your shoulder and they're like, hey, you're the chosen one. I totally want you to make me happen because you can do it. You know, like I really believe that that is a thing. And so this idea came along and it was like, Emma, you should make face masks because people are going to need them. And I was like, no, Emma, I'm totally too busy with being an academic. That is such a big commitment. I don't want to do it. But the idea persisted, right? And I, I <laughs> like three days went by and I knew that everyone was gonna do this at some point. It's just natural to make face masks. Like, like the virus is here, it's not going away anytime soon. You know, like there's an obvious progression as to how our community has to respond. And then I, I, I had the opportunity to either be part of that response or not. And I was, I was messaging my business mentor from Ntombi and I was like, you know, I have this idea and it won't leave me. And then I like, won't leave me. And I kept describing what the idea was over a few WhatsApp messages. And then I just said, whatever, I'm going to do it. So I went to the, the place where I usually get laundry done. And there's a seamstress who works there. And I walked in and I said, hi, Charlotte, I have an idea. I want to make face masks. And she was like, you know, I had the same idea. And I was just about to start. And I said, do you have material and a pattern? And she said, no. And I said, okay. And I went to Mr. Price and I bought pillowcases. And then I went home and I Googled like for a pattern on how to make a face mask. And I went back to her and I said, all right, I'll pay you. Please, can you make me face masks, you know, from these pillowcases? And I don't really know what I was thinking. I was just thinking that we're gonna have so many problems coming at us. Um, and I'll take the moment to be a little bit vulnerable. Um, around about this time, I knew that, so this was before lockdown even started, right? I knew that things were going to change very quickly. And I knew that I wasn't gonna get home to Johannesburg anytime soon. And I have a really, really, really lovely grandmother who lives in Johannesburg. and. She is a you know part of the vulnerable population. And the realization of the risk that this whole thing will put her life in was so traumatizing for me. And I think it's both a blessing and a curse to handle emotions this way. But instead of letting that disarm me, I just became obsessed with finding something to do that was helpful. And so I just had this energy, instead of feeling really afraid of, you know, not maybe seeing family again and stuff like that, I just knew that I had a lot of energy and it could either manifest as anxiety and depression or I could do something. And so I honestly had no idea what I was doing. I just bought pillowcases and I made masks and then I thought, cool, now I have five masks. Charlotte likes this idea. Let me wear it. Let me see how it feels. And then it kind of just, that's how it started really. Um, so I went back to her the next day and she told me that, you know, and I said to her, I, I need us to make masks at a price point that the local community will be able to you know afford it at and she comes from Kaimandi and we discussed that and I said to her I'm also concerned that you're going to lose your job because of lockdown like if people aren't allowed to come in how are you going to put food on the table right so I wanted to know how much she felt her time was worth in terms of labor but then also how we could minimize the material costs so that we could keep a low cost to give these masks to people who really need to be wearing them um, and we, there was this conversation that we had that was so distinct. She was telling me how no one really knows about the virus. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was saying, um, now, so, so I mean, we fast forward about a week, so now lockdown was a thing and people were no longer supposed to be going into work. And um, she was saying to me how in the taxi rank, you know, she overheard conversations of how people were saying they don't understand what this virus is. They just told they can't go to work 
the the language that their bosses used has been above their head they don't understand really what's going on and this really upset me as a linguist fundamentally because if you think that we have an issue in terms of the tech divide think again we have an issue in terms of access to information like if you can't speak english what use is the internet to you if you can't speak another majority language if you speak a minority language what use is the internet to you right wow um, yeah it's a, such a real real it's such a real problem and that's why computational linguistics and translation is really important to me because how do we make uh, information accessible you know to to people who need it anyway um so i took that with me and i put out a call on instagram and on whatsapp and i was saying to friends listen please just circulate translations of what's actually going on tell people in simple language let them know because this is not fair this is an injustice and, that we are committing and did people get back to you with with they some translations did. They did. And so I was like, cool, while I manage this mask thing, I'm going to manage this translation thing. And so I made a, a Google Doc from the World Health Organization. And this was before linguistic material was being available, was being made available from the government, government channels. Um, and I just sent this doc out and I got people to translate it. And I realized, okay, I'm doing this mask thing and I'm doing this translation thing. And around about the same time, in the same week, a really good friend phoned from uh, Johannesburg and she spoke about making uh, air ventilate like, like respirators right so we were, we were talking about how ventilation units work how would you make a respirator how could we 3d print it and i was just like well i know people who know these answers and i don't so we started you know looking at how we can bring that together and in in the space of a week i just had these three components of a project and i decided that i wanted to call it something and for some reason to me like honestly the word Afika just came to me. And I was like, where does this word come from? I know it's a Tosa word. I don't know where I picked it up. You know what I mean? The and linguist in you was coming out. Girl, I tell you, there's actually a very cute story. When I, re I reflected upon it, you know, I've never used it. So Afika is the verb to arrive, right? It's a Tosa verb to arrive. And what happened was my, my, my father better not watch this because he's forbidden me to give people lifts all right on the side of the road and in this country that makes complete sense um but there was this one day where i gave three ladies a lift somewhere um you know on the stellenbosch highway to kaimandi and i drove into kaimandi and i dropped them off at the house and one of those ladies name <laughs> was afika and i remember this because i thought that was really cool it sounded like africa but it's not which is the same error that most people make when they see this project. They're like, did you try to spell Africa? I'm like, no, I really didn't. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I decided to call this project that because there were just things happening. And I felt like every response that I wanted to take to this virus arriving in South Africa came from the perspective of being Afrocentric. It had to be something that was made by South Africans that suited South Africans. We were promoting the 12 official South African languages. And the, what we've done since is we've got little videos on YouTube and on Likey translating um, facts about COVID. And we still have to get the 12th South African language, which is sign language, South African sign language. We don't have all of our content in that just yet. Um, but yeah, it, and, and, and building the ventilator, we, we, we focused on um, using 3D printing using low cost products, you, you know, you should be able to go to a hardware store to build this mechanical ventilator. That was the idea, like in a rural clinic, how would we, how would we respond to this? What would we use? Yeah, and being super together, local. You know, yeah, exactly. And, and it just, for some reason, somewhere in my life, I heard this theme of African solutions to African problems. And I mean, this, this is beyond the scope of, of this chat, but like, you know, being white in South Africa brings up a big question like, what is an African problem? Can I understand that if all I really know is Eurocentric approaches, etc.? cetera? Um, but the idea of naming this project Afika was this notion of, I want to say that South Africans have arrived to this situation. We have arrived. It's kind of awkward, you know, you call a, a product Afika and it's face masks and a virus has arrived in your country and you're like, well, masks have arrived, you know? <laughs> It just seemed like a natural word to use. But yeah, that's a whole mouthful to really just describe what the project is. It's, it's an umbrella for making masks, making information accessible. And we developed a, a really solid design of the ventilator and we submitted it to the DTI. 
and they were running a competition and it turns out we're not sophisticated enough so we're not quite eligible but the designs out there it's open source if anyone's interested they can look for it that's yeah. great that's great. So, I mean, Emma, you've, you've really given us a lot to, to think about um, and certainly just to marvel at um, all the work that you've done in, in quite a short amount of time, um, given uh, where we're at. Um, it, I want to pass over to Aya. Um, I'm sure that the audience have got a lot of questions um, they'd love to just unpack with you a little bit more. I've really enjoyed this conversation with you so far. I know we could keep going the whole afternoon just <laughs> chatting about all the stories along the way. Um, and I hope that when it's safe again to do so, um, you know, we might um, catch you on a TEDx stage again. <laughs> Um, uh, but in the meantime, I want to hand over to Aya, um, who's going to uh, share some of the questions that the audience have submitted on Slido. Um, yeah, and uh, over to you, Aya and Emma, for our Q&A. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. Um, I just want to open by saying, Emma, what a if infectious energy you have. I mean, I want to go and translate something or go and <laughs> sweep the streets right now just to do something. <laughs> Because the energy has just, you know, transferred through the fiber, through the internet and the waves. Um, and you're such a good guest to have. And it's such an inspiring story to hear how you've taken um, this active role with your citizenship in, I guess, contributing to, towards your community and the, the country at large. Um, and without further ado, I'll take uh, some questions from our Slido. Please, anyone in the uh, call who, if you haven't posted a question on the slide or, or you haven't upvoted yet, please have a look at that. Um, the information is on the chat in terms of how you can log on that. And it was also in the email that was um, shared with the invite. Um, so Emma, we'll start with uh, what's next for you? Where, where do you see yourself and your initiatives um, in, let's say, the next 10 years? I love answering these questions about <laughs> 10 years and five years. I've come to realize that those are all just guesses. You know, I've never really had a 10 year and a five year plan. I've had like a one year guess. Um, <laughs> and, and, and in answer to this question and in response to, to what you just mentioned, I like in every email signature that I have sent under Afika, I have made it very clear that together we do more. And so much has happened in this venture only because so many people have been involved, which also determines the future of the venture. It also determines where it goes. You know, there are teams behind the translating and I'm only one person, right? So I try to manage as much as I can. And if more people want to get involved with, with doing the translation work, I'm really excited. I have some visions, but you know, someone needs to step up to guide that while I'm guiding something else. And, and um, I don't really know where it's going. All I know is that at some point we'll have our new normal and COVID will pass, right? Yeah. And so much growth has happened in a short amount of time. And the masks that I'm currently making are looking at being around for a while, fashionable pieces, statement items. And the idea of that is so that when, when, you know, work commences and I have seamstresses who cannot go back, they still have, some opportunity to be making income, whether that's making face masks or whether that changes to making something else that's an item of need. So in terms of the people that I employ and pay every week, those are the seamstresses. And the only planning I have for the future is how will I make sure that either they are re-boarded, you know, re-onboarded back into some support system or I will be yeah. figuring out how they get supported. Okay, that sounds good. And talk to me about uh, Ndombi. So that's the plan for Africa going forward. Um, what do you see happening with Ndombi in the next year, in the next five years? So this has been a very big entrepreneurial lesson of learning when to walk away. I think that it's really important that people know that your first venture is most likely to fail. And it would only have been a failure in terms of the realization of the idea but it would not have been a failure in terms of the learning. 
So I don't know. I had planned to put the project down after my honors and go abroad or continue with masters. Mm. Um, and with the situation as it is, you know, unit testing a device that is supposed to be available in a public space is very much determined yeah. you know, <laughs> by the access to public space. So that yeah. question is just like, we don't know right now. Yeah. yeah. So we're waiting for the new norm to sort of pass and go back to the old one or something yes. that resembles that. All right. Um, so we have another question here in terms of after you gave your first TEDx talk um, and it was very well received, how did your peers and your immediate community, so that would be your friends and family um, and your peers in, in university respond to that? I think many people congratulated me and uh, I appreciated that. Uh, yeah. I'm not one to gloat all that much, although I won't lie, it was really nice to be able to use that whole welcome or thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> I could actually <laughs> use that little uh, social media slogan <laughs> with a real <laughs> smile. <laughs> um, but I think many people just uh, congratulated me and I don't really share what I'm doing. So a lot of them were kind of surprised and it felt nice to be acknowledged, but it didn't, you know, it didn't shift in shift my status. I'm not like some big celebrity and I very much prefer it that way. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, so we also have some people interested in what are your thoughts in terms of you've identified now two separate streams of really challenges facing communities um, within uh, Stellenbosch and uh, I guess nationally and you could even argue internationally in terms of some of the basic human rights that you're addressing with the interventions you're having. So what else would you say are some of the fundamentally broken systems or areas where you think if we have some really talented and energetic people, you would sort of channel or point them towards? Language. And, and you know, that may be the linguist in me, but if you go onto Google Translate, you can translate to Fosa and Zulu, and mm. it's not even you know always that accurate. But what about the other South African languages? They're not yeah. represented, you know. And 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 why why do I think that that's so important? Well, you know, the tech industry in South Africa tends to have a pale male shade, and we are working hard to change that, right? Yeah. But there are like there's maybe one university that's actively pushing out language technology as a, as a field of study and profession, right? Yeah. And you have so many people who are entering the tech world that cannot speak local languages. And you have many people who are native, you know, to these languages. These are the mother tongues, but they're not being equipped with the skills to write formal grammars, to build translation tools. We're watching, we're not only watching a language die in our own country, multiple, we're watching cultures yeah. die. But put all of that humanitarian, you know, important stuff aside, how do you expect to educate a nation if you're not going to use their mother tongue, right? So we have so many fundamental issues in this country. If I could allocate resources, I'd be like, cool people, we need to start developing translation, corpus texts, this is the language, it needs, this is the root of the problem. Yeah. Okay, so really there, it's, it's solving for access for the average South African that you're really interested in um, getting yeah. a solution to. Yeah, because I mean, so let's say, we, let's give everyone a tech device. Great, everyone has access to the internet. They can't speak the language. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we, we take yeah. for granted how fundamental exactly. language is in our exactly. access to the world. All right, um, so I'm gonna get you to stretch your thinking a bit further with a related question, which is, um, what would be your advice to someone who's interested in starting a social impact organization? It couldn't be some okay. of your learnings as you highlighted that there have been many and you also uh, talked us through maybe how maybe accepting failure might be one of them. So any points you have around that for someone interested in getting more involved with uh, social impact work? Okay. Don't, don't wait for your solution to be perfect. If you see a problem in your community, if it's not your problem, take some solution that you think the community wants to the community and then just find out if it's actually solving what they need to have solved. We, I, I, have, I have found this in Afika, you know, having a bit of a savior complex, just making complete assumptions that, that are real to me, but are not really effective in the space where I'm trying to effect change. You know, mm -hmm. one thing about masks, right is you can make them 
But if people don't want to wear them, well, then you have like a whole different problem. You know, I, I, I was, I'm sitting at a point where I had stock of masks and the, the, the community to which I was taking them saying, you need these, were looking at me and saying, no, we don't. And we're not going to take them and we're not going to pay for them. Yeah. Right? So when you, want to, when you want to start a social venture, really be humble. You know, mm. don't, you know, like just come up with your solution, but take it to a community. Don't think you're saving them. Like that, it's a very easy mistake to make. So first start there. First take what you have to a community that you're trying to help. If it's your own community, but then you know it's a solution, right? So start yeah. working on it. Thank, thanks for that, Ima. So I've distilled um, four points here, which the first being perfection is the enemy of good. The second being understand your context or the problem you're solving for. The third being be humble. Um, and then the fourth, I've just written test, test, test. Um, is there a fifth point you would add to that list? Learn how to summarize ideas as well as Aya does. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was beautifully put, Aya. Really, like, yeah, it, that was really beautifully put. And, and, and I mean it, it's a fifth point. You know, just make it as simple as you can. It's a TED philosophy. If you can't put it into three sentences, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about, really. All right. Um, thanks, Ima. Um, so we still have a bit of more time, so I'll go through some, some more questions again. Um, so we have some questions here around how did you find some of the people you've ended up partnering with and you've ended up, let's say, even learning from as you've worked through the various ventures you've, you've been involved with? Your vibe attracts your tribe. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm super thankful to the Ellen Gray Overs Foundation, which has, uh, you know, exposed me to other high impact individuals who are my age. And I'm, I'm really thankful for people who I know have even come to this talk who I've just met along the way and curious minds attract one another, I like to think. Um, so in terms of networking, don't be afraid to approach people with your idea. Don't be afraid to share it because you'll be so amazed at who wants to jump in on the bandwagon and who will now be a part of your network as you opened your mouth with your enthusiasm right so that's yeah that's definitely one one point <laughs> all right um so in your own words right let's say now you sort of looking back and doing a 30 for 30 how would you like to articulate the impact you would like to have um, and this can be around access, this can be around education, this can be around um, other forms of problem solving for the various organizations um, or initiatives you've been involved with more recently, Africa. Sorry, I, I, well, I didn't catch so, you on so the, the first question, the, the question is, how would you like to, how would you share what the impact you would like to, to have with Africa is? Sure, you know, at the end of the day, the only way that, that I can claim to be having any social impact is by being able to measure it. Mm. And I know that I'm having an impact because I pay women every Friday and I'm able to pay them. Wow. And I know that they don't have money if I'm not paying them. And, and I've never really thought about this project beyond that scope. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm 24, I'm quite young, right? And it's really, it's quite, it's a lot of pressure to have to pay people. You know, it can feel really overwhelming. <laughs> but at the same time, it can feel really fulfilling. And, and it's a yeah. sense of responsibility that I have now. So the, the only, only dimensions in which I've thought about my impact have been the amount of money that I know I'm putting on people's table. And, and that's the thing about the FICA project. It, it, uh, you need to look, if anyone's looking to start a venture, I won't lie. You need to have capital and monetary capital is, is look, I started in Tombi without that. I pitched for investment funding and I got it. And I was about to spend it on a Tombi this year, right? That's what we had chosen to do and we couldn't. But I had that money and I said to my co-founders, look, I'd like to loan this amount to start the FICA. And, you know, I made enough money to then, you know, pay it back. But but ha having having that capital really was was part of being able to start this project and yeah just being able to pay people at the at the end of the week is, is enough of an impact for me to know that i'm making a, a difference wow um thanks ima i think that's all the time we have for questions today um again echo the sentiment that you are an absolute inspiration and i think for me the powerful quote that i'm going to walk away with 
and the challenge I'm going to set for myself today is just, I guess, be like Emma in, in the sense that you, you have a quote which you've said where you said how you articulate impact is just being able to pay the women that work on your projects um, every Friday and understanding that without the particular initiatives um, which you've been able to help um, coordinate them within, um, they really don't have too many options outside of. And I think that's really an amazing, um, powerful idea. And I guess in terms of just taking responsibility for your, for your citizenship as well. Um, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to hand over to Dumi to close off and say any, any other remarks um, that, that she may have. So Dumi, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I and Emma are like totally on fire. Um, I, um, I really enjoyed that. Um, and thank you to everybody who um, posted questions um, on Slido. Uh, it's great to hear, you know, some of the questions that that you all had. Um, so yeah, that that brings us to the end of mm -hmm. our first um, virtual. Um, event for 2020. This is incredibly exciting. Um, sure. Am I I wanna, sorry, I, I really want to just at least th I want to say thank you to you and thank you to TEDx and thank you to Aya and thank you to every single person who is here virtually with us from Pakistan and India. Thank you to the friends who have responded that they, they show up and and I just want to close to me. It's really important for everyone. Please take this with you in your heart. It may have been done before, but it hasn't been done by you. Just remember that. For every venture you want to start, just remember that. Thank you. Thank you so, so much.